in our next conversation, we're going to talk about how artificial intelligence can be leveraged for good. Uh, joining me, we have Alexander Diaz, the head of AI for social good at google.org. Please give him a round of applause. And we have Nick Kane, the Vice President of Strategy and in Innovation for the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Round of applause, please. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, I told you when we did the prep call that uh, this is one of the conversations I'm most excited about this week because I'm a nerd. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for being AI here. It's not only for nerds. <laughs> it's for, ev for everybody. It is for everyone. Um, so we're hearing so much about the promise of AI right now, but people are still sort of scared or wary of it. And I'm wondering if you can sort of talk about how it can be helpful, especially for smallholder farmers and, and how it's being used. That's right. You can take that one. Uh, hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, it is it is incredibly an incredibly powerful tool, especially in the hands, and especially when it's built with these communities that can use it best, right? So that's how do you make sure that you're not essentially waving around a solution in search of a problem, but act actively working with the communities that need it and can use it best, and informing the parameters around which the technology can get built. Some examples of orgs that we have funded in this space, like Digital Green and One Acre right. Fund, um, have been doing amazing work even before the most recent AI boom. Um, but what's what's really changed in the last couple of years is the the capabilities of improving things like weather forecasting, um, like computer vision models to figure out if a crop has a pest, um, or to provide that combination of factors, right? So flood is coming and uh, pest is prevalent. What does that now mean for the agro-advisory, the pesticide sprays right. that you play, the advisory on what seeds to plant or when to harvest? The ability to now harness and combine that data yeah in a very easy to use manner has only really been possible in the last couple of years. And importantly for farmers, especially that might not be the most literate, you can now use your own voice and these things can respond to you in your own natural language. Um, and that, the, the, the thing I wanna leave you all with is, this stuff is not gonna happen alone. It has to happen in partnership, but it also needs to be um, managed by these organizations and owned by these organizations mm -hmm. to actually build that, that long-term resilience. Yeah, I want to come back to that point about participatory, you know, development in a minute. And, and you know, Nick, these tools sound great. Access is obviously very important. So I, I'm wondering how you and, and the foundation make sure that farmers can get that access. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think just for context for those that may not be familiar with our work, we're the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation is a global philanthropy uh, roughly five years old, focused really exclusively at this intersection between AI um, and driving positive social impact. Um, and so we work with populations around the world on um, how to both have access to some of these tools and also be designers, developers, and, and builders of AI tools in service of their work. Um, what I would say about the broader question of kind of the, the role of AI um, in this space is, and how I would encourage the audience to think about it is um, to start to pull apart what we mean by AI, um, mm. what we're actually talking about is a broad set of tools that actually share one or a handful of things in common that Alex already alluded to, which is um, they're tools that help humans who need to make decisions uh, get better insights into how to make those decisions more effectively, learn whether their decisions are driving the thing that they want to make right. happen, happen, right. um, and then help them adjust and ideally get to the better outcomes, whether that's in the context of agriculture um, it could be in the context of delivering the end products that, sure. they, that they grow to the people who need them. Um, it could be in reducing food waste, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? There are many, many different um, pieces to the, to the overall stack of getting food in the, in the, to the places it needs to be. Um, so with that, I think to answer your question around access, um, you know, I think obviously uh, we play a role as, as, as the philanthropic sector um, to make sure that uh, nonprofits of all types, and particularly those that are serving, in this case, um, you know, smallholder farmers, but also any nonprofit that is advocating on behalf of any part of that you know, larger stack that sure. I just mentioned, to feel like this is a conversation that they belong in, mm -hmm. um, and that um, their funders who may be saying, you know, what do you what do you want to work on next? What's your big vision? That part of that conversation is, have you thought about the role of machine learning and AI in sure. your work, and what might it take to um, to get you to be able to experiment? Yeah, I feel like, the, uh, you know, going back to that fear part, I, I think of AI as democratizing so much of, of what's available now and, and creating that access. Um, you know, going back to the participatory sort of development of these tools, can you talk about how you, you can work with farming organizations to do that, to actually meet the needs that farmers have so 
so much of the tools that we've had in the past have been made for farmers without their input. Yeah, I mean, one one clear example from some of the organizations that we support is, I mean, one, obviously, the table stakes is bringing the folks around the table and understanding how they currently do the work, how they currently farm, what, what technology tools, if any, do they currently use. That way, if you're going to design a solution, you find a way to integrate into what they already are using as opposed to trying to create something net new that would just not get used. Yeah. Um, so an example being, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of farmers might use um, uh, advisory services by calling a call center. Um, that's been a very um, you know popular mechanism yeah. in some countries. How do we figure out? Okay, how do no one's talked about bringing the call centers into the room yeah. and figuring out how right. what support they might need right. um, to be able to make sure that the advisory services are also supportive of what they need and the limitation that they have yeah. that ultimately then also get into the the hands of the farmers. It's so exciting. It's so exciting to have that that come around. I, I want to ask you both. There's so much uncertainty. Um, among investors in the finance community, they, they feel like you know agriculture is very risky to invest in. Mm. How can AI sort of de-risk sort of the, uh, agriculture in a way that they feel comfortable making those investments and helping folks? Uh, I'm happy to start. I mean, I think it builds on um, what Alex said uh, a moment ago around the uh, unique and uh, rapidly advancing ability of you know, AI's ability to help um, merge different types of data mm -hmm. into ever more comprehensive and dynamic um, projections and predictive work, um, I think that can give uh, investors uh, and all kinds of stakeholders a sense of, I mean, de-risking is about changing my perception of the future um, and changing my confidence in what may happen in the future, right? And I think, um, uh, that is the way you the way you bring down confidence intervals and make them smaller and yeah. a projection is is more data yeah. and better data and as we just said that's that's AI's greatest strength. That's great, Alex. Yeah, something I'd add is I mean one there's a huge role for philanthropy you play right. I think we 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 view our capital as risk capital and hopefully de-risking interesting intervention, interventions and building an evidence base for certain approaches or de-risking the creation of data sets that might be needed to even then create the model on top of that. So there's a huge role that the philanthropic capital can play. Um, but what we've started to see, and we're working with organizations like CGIAR and the, and the Crop Trust, is what is really, really helpful that new AI models are doing is rapidly iterating the scientific like ideation process, right. hypothesis generation, simulation. And the, the promise now ahead of us is we can now start to say engineer new crops and bring new viable seeds that are nu nutrient rich to market in two to three years, hopefully, as opposed to the 10 that is standard today. Sure. And with the rapidly changing climate, you need to be harnessing that type of technology and accelerant potential to make sure that we have future food systems that are sustainable, that are nutrient rich, that are adaptive to the environments. But there's also near term things that, that need to be done as well. Right. Great work that we're doing with the World Food Program. Um, is trying to improve the ability of forecasting food shocks to begin with, right. right? There's so many data layers that exist that can be really helpful at saying, hey, this this area, this crop is under stress, mm -hmm. and we're working closely with our Google research colleagues, and we're providing funding to kind of bring this incent this collaboration together to then hopefully um, provide better granularity, more lead time, that ultimately gives orgs like the WFP more yeah. time to do what they need to do to protect families and, and, and to help mitigate the worst of the worst of these crises. It's all in helping them prepare, right? Yeah. Exactly. Nick, do you want to comment? Um, I would just, uh, you, you started to touch on a, a topic that I know we talked a little bit about in our earlier conversation, which is um, where are the gaps in, in, in that data and um, what does it look like as federal funding uh, has you know, potentially declined, not potentially, has declined in many of these cases, and, and certain data sets maybe have come offline. I do think there's a role for philanthropy to step in, not necessarily to fully replace the funding that has been lost. I think that would be really, really difficult to do and perhaps not the most strategic choice, but to change the questions that we're asking oh, yeah. about, um, particularly have a responsibility, I think, as technology funders um, to bring in a mindset around data sovereignty into our conversations with, with partners. And what I mean by that is asking the question about um, ownership of the data, long-term sustainability of the data mm -hmm. set or the system on which it's going to be hosted, um, getting into the weeds in that way yeah. um, to kind of have a, a shift in mindset that um, you know, understands that, that this needs to have a long life and mm -hmm. thinking about the conditions that will enable that. On a, on a related point, you started off by talking about the cuts to federal funding and you know, databases are, are being wiped out. So in a world where data is being demonized, how, is, how can AI work? You want to take a swing at that one? <laughs> I don't know the data. I don't know the data itself is being demonized. I think I think I think data 
sets were the unfortunate casualty of a broader set of, of, of forces that led to where we are now. But um, I don't know. The, you may have some thoughts on, on generally how to make up for lacks of data in, in making systems still work. Yeah, and I'd say like not, not all data is equal. Mm -hmm. um, I think the quality of data is what's most important. Um, and, and not to say that quality data has not been you know, affected. They, they, they certainly have. Um, and we're doing what we can to support. I think what's also, what's also interesting and possible and happening now is finding ways to interoperate these data sets. Yeah. Um, so they might, queries that ultimately take, or research that would take, you know, you going down five or six different data sets, you can now start to combine in healthy ways to then hopefully drive your, your, your inquiry, your, your curiosity, learn at the speed of your curiosity through your natural language. Yeah, and it allows you to model, right? And have those different sets of models in place. So again, that there's, there's preparation, there's plans in place. I'll also add, I, this is something Alex and I were just talking about on the way over. Um, uh, in a world where perhaps large macro scale data sets are um, not being sustained or we're in a process of rebuilding, I think we need to think about the ways that combining and partnership, combining data mm -hmm. sets and partnership between organizations, um, then in aggregate can approximate the scale right. and scope of the data sets that we perhaps have lost. And sure. um, I think, unfortunately, and I think the philanthropic sector has a major role to, uh, has has led to, has contributed to the, the point where we are and also needs to be a part of the solution in terms of empowering organizations and providing them the resources, time, and space to look for ways to um, whether it's bring a data set and hand it to my partner organization so that right. they can add to it, or even if I've developed a technical product and Alex's organization has the, you know, the scale to deliver it to the people who need right. it, finding the creative ways to make that happen. Can you talk more about how your organizations work together? Well, for full, full transparency, Alex and I used to be colleagues for a number of years and I've learned a lot um, in, in this work together. Um, now I think we are part of a broader ecosystem of funders that are really, really interested in um, encouraging more of the organizations in our field to think about these questions. And not just to think about them, but to take the tactical steps to feel like they can, you know, whether when they're talking to a, a nonprofit or another partner, and as I, as I alluded to earlier, that partner's starting to experiment or explore with an AI project. How do we make sure that not just Google.org and uh, the McGovern Foundation and a number of others who have been working in this space for a while, but philanthropy at large yeah. is ready to engage in a strategic conversation that says, oh, I, I, I think I have the, the, the core knowledge I need to kind of like have a conversation with you about how, what resources it might take to explore this project and what would be the responsible choice and what's the right sequence of, of product development. And some of, these, some of these things that I think are um, maybe feel a little bit foreign or scary to some sure, folks and, sure. mm -hmm. and I think are quite, quite learnable. And I think things that we just need to as a sector lean into a little bit more. I know you're thinking about this too. Yeah, I know, and I heard you ask Barry in the pre previous panel, like what's giving you hope? And I think one one kernel of, of, of one thing that's giving me hope is is really the appetite for collaboration that yeah. we're really yeah. seeing um, skyrocket in, in the last couple of years. And folks kind of pulling, you know, that, that humility forward and saying, you know, we think we can bring this unique right. asset to the table. So let's figure out what other pieces do we need in that puzzle um, to really drive, uh, reduce duplication, reduce siloization, right. and really most importantly drive the scaled impact that we want to be seeing. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about AI because of that silo breaking that can happen because you're seeing it happen in real time between the two of you, between other organizations. What do you hope, you know, over the next six months? Because we'll, we'll be full into, you know, what has happened over, over the, the last nine months. We'll, we'll understand a lot of the impacts on, on hunger and and humanitarian aid. What do you hope sort of new tools come out of, of these collaborations uh, and, and partnerships? It's a good question. I mean, what I like to say, just to build on your point, is that in this has been true in so many sectors. I say it most often in conversations about the climate crisis, but I think it's true in this room and in so many others, is that the opportunity cost of siloed work is unacceptably high. Um, we have, um, in the context of the climate crisis, there are, you know, organizations whose core work is at cross purposes with the goals of, of many of those of us in this room and they're using AI to further their work. And so I think we as a sector need to just reframe how we think about yeah. the opportunity in front of us to use the tools. In terms of what can come up out of, of, of partnership, um, I think we've hit on some of them, right? Um, larger data sets, um, complementary work, right? Creation of a, of a tool here and delivery there, um, creation of really high quality content from an entity that actually may not 
again, have the um, infrastructure to get into the hands of the right people, but why, why should the infrastructure team also then try to create the content that they right, need if someone right, else has already got it? Right. That's true in so many sectors that, that, that we work in. Those are the types of things I'd like to see more of. Absolutely. Alex. What would you add? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've launched a program called the, our AI Collaboratives, um, and we have one specifically on food security, and we, we launched them in earnest at the end of last year, early this year. Um, and in the next six months, we're going to have some prototypes. Um, some of that work is already live. I can't talk about it yet, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, but it's exactly that. It's like, how do we help kind of improve the ability to create new seeds um, that are nutrient-rich? How do we help right. improve the ability to forecast food shocks? And most importantly, get that, into the, that information into the hands of farmers that know what to do best with it. Thank you. I'm glad both of you are working on these issues. Thank you for that, and thank you for being here today. Give them a round of applause, thank please. You. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you.